So hello and welcome. Happy Friday. Today is Friday, July the 8th, and this is Backyard Beekeeping Questions and Answers, episode number 166. It's 82 degrees Fahrenheit outside right now, which is 28 degrees Celsius, and we're in a little bit of a, uh, a dearth. We're in a bit of a, a rain uh, absence. So we need more rain. We need more precipitation. We're two inches behind, according to the weather people. So I'm Frederick Dunn, and this is the way to be. So today we're going to talk about what else? The questions and subjects that have been submitted over the past week, either right here by commenting down below one of my videos or going to my website, which is thewaytobe.org, and you can fill out a form right there. You can be anonymous even. So what else do we have going on? Bees, yeah, according to the opening, bees are on clover. Everything you saw in the opening, the photos, and the video were done today. So milkweed heavy, no no surprise there. Lots of uh, clover, so white clover, purple, red clover, and uh, there must be some other things going on out there because the pollen tells us that there are. They don't get much pollen off of the milkweed, obviously, because milkweed pollen it just clings to their feet and drives the bees a little stressful there. So what else is going on? Oh yeah, and the one photo in the opening today of the bee on the clover is the latest design for one of my coffee cups. So if you collect those, look for that down in the links below. So the video description will show you every topic we're going to cover today. So I'm glad that you're here. Let's get started. First one comes from YouTube channel name Sinister Hippo. How long do you give a queen before you judge her laying? It's been about four to five weeks, and some queens I'm not happy with compared to others. Some are spotty, some have speckles of drone. So what that means is spotty brood pattern for those who are new. When you look at the brood and you pull up your frame and you're looking at how well organized your queen is in her egg laying, then you should see consistent concentric rings going out of different stages of development. So in the center, generally speaking, of the drawn comb in the cells, you're gonna see eggs from the queen. She'll start laying there, and then she'll keep laying and laying and laying. And then of course they progress from eggs to open larvae, and then from larvae to pupa, and that's when they're capped and everything else. But those should be pretty consistent, predictable patterns. It shouldn't be spread all over different frames and everything else. Although, it's been four to five weeks, since a uh, new queen was put in there, this is with cock swarms. Now, keep in mind, not every queen that is in a swarm of bees, when you collect them, uh, is in lay. So she may not even have been mated yet. So we have to kind of push the calendar further down if we have a virgin queen with a swarm of bees. And that's why it can take several weeks uh, before she even gets started because she has to finish... Uh, her process of settling in, maybe sexually maturing, and then going out and doing her virgin flight where she's going to mate with the drones, and then she's going to come back, then she's going to start laying. And often they do start out inexperienced. They might put multiple eggs in a single cell. They may be sporadic and lay eggs all over the place because they haven't settled. They might be a little nervous and flighty. So I would give them some time. It just depends on what's going on, but these are swarms we're dealing with. Uh, and so he also qualifies it by saying, because we might say, well, what's going on in the environment? Is your environment like Fred's environment where there isn't enough rainwater right now and maybe they're not bringing in a lot of honey? So a lot of nectar with which to make honey. I have to clear that up before somebody gets me on that. So he says also uh, the other flows are good and uh, other queens are laying beautifully. Queens laying beautifully experience more senior queens. I would give them some time because the good news is they are laying eggs. The good news is there is production going on there. And if they really don't like that queen, if she's really bad news, they'll supersede her. Which is different from swarming. That's when they don't like the queen, they get rid of her, and they supersede her by taking one of her eggs and producing another queen or several replacement queens. So that's how that goes. Not happy with it? Well, that's your call, what you're willing to put up with. We know that uh, we're kind of controlling our own backyard genetics to some degree, even though this open mating that they do when they're flying to drone congregation areas everywhere, uh, we don't know who they're connecting with and genetically mixing with. So 
uh, it's still potluck. And that's why I kind of like my spring swarms because they tend to be the healthiest and strongest. What would let you know when you're looking at that frame if uh, the colony is producing enough for them? Because there are other factors that contribute to the fact that she may be a sporadic layer. What is the population of that hive when it comes to the swarm that you've collected? Didn't describe the size of the swarms. It just says new queens or queens from caught swarms. So a swarm might be you know, the size of your fist. A swarm might be the size of a basketball. So big differences in how many eggs the workers will allow the queen to produce because they need an adequate division of labor within the hive to feed the brood that's up and coming. And if she produces too many eggs and they don't have enough resources, meaning bee power, the number of bees, how many bees does it take to handle a youth social society of bees? At least 5,000 based on what the academics tell us. So you need a lot of bees. If we have a small cluster, then it also works against them because what else is going on? They're not getting replacements. So they are in a state of attrition. They are just... On average, depending on where you live, but where I am, the average is about 500 bees per day lost due to foraging incidents, old age, and everything else. 500 a day. So a queen that's got a big support system within the hive, if she's laying over a thousand eggs a day, then we're 21 days out if everything was perfect before we started seeing actual replacement bees. So for 21 days, do the math, on average, losing 500 bees per day. So there you go. You would really be dwindling the whole time. So we need a massive swarm to make that work. And if you've got a couple of swarms that aren't doing very well, maybe pick your favorite queen and combine those two. Or shake more nurse bees into that colony and give them an extra boost. Question number two, rolling right along. This comes from Daryl. Off topic. I know, but I was wondering how one can increase the moisture content of honey. I know the moisture problem is usually that the percentage is too high, but in west central Texas, especially this year with the record heat and hardly any rain, the honey often seems to dry out so much it's almost too thick to pour. I've heard that you can put honey near water and moisture will be drawn into the honey. Someone else recommended adding water to the honey. Okay, this is a problem that most people would like to have. I don't see it personally as a problem. But uh, the term that you're looking for, honey, is hygroscopic, which means that if it's in a high humidity area and the percentage of moisture in the honey is lower than the environment in which it's being stored in an open container, it will actually draw moisture from the environment into the honey and increase its moisture percentage. Likewise, if you take your honey and you put it in a lower uh, humidity level environment, then it will shed its moisture into the atmosphere. That's why the bees fan it. Because if you notice, you can cause evaporation just by air movement, even in a higher humidity environment, as long as the heat is up. And you can keep that air moving and you can cool and uh, not cool so much, although that probably happens, but it will dehydrate the honey through air movement alone. But dry, fast moving air needs to be there all the time. Anyway, I don't see this as a problem. And I would suggest rather than trying to find a high humidity environment to put your honey in to add moisture to it, which seems really counterintuitive to me, um, I would rather see you do something like warm it up so it would pour better. That's why a lot of commercial beekeepers have hot rooms and they would be in the high 90s, low 100s. So you could safely bring your honey temperature in a room up to 110 degrees Fahrenheit and uh, then it would pour easier and get that into the jars and you know, your honey bears, whatever you put your honey in and transfer it that way. Get it in there. I would much rather see you do that than add moisture, but let's say you're set on adding moisture. Uh, for one thing, what are the parameters? If you look at, and I hope everyone does for a minute here, because a lot of you will be taking honey off soon if you haven't already. This year where I live, we are, even with the rain deficit, we uh, have an unbelievable amount of honey in all of the hives. We don't feed any of the hives and they are out of control. In fact, they're presenting challenges because we're having to super colonies that I never expected to super so fast so early in the year. 
uh, for us normal, a big nectar flow would be goldenrod and, you know, asters and everything that happens in the fall. But here we are, first week of July, and I was out there yesterday, and the upper box of almost every hive I have is uh, full of capped honey, so I had to super them. So here's the other thing. You go to your, you can go to the United States Department of Agriculture website, depending on what country you're in. Usually honey is controlled or they have an inspection system in place. So you can go to your government's website or whatever entity is in charge of honey and you can look up honey parameters, what's acceptable and what's rejectable. So that's kind of how I look at things. What would the food inspector be looking for and what are the highs and lows? Can honey be too dry? Well, I found out in the United States is a grading system and honey can be all the way up to 21% moisture. That would be the upper limit and it would be rejected at that point. Now for the low limit, I couldn't find that anywhere. In other words, I tried to find out to help answer this question, what's the low limit on honey moisture percentages or even one? Well, there are grading systems that require the honey to be within, let's say, below 19% honey and then above 15% honey and things like, or honey, 15% moisture, 15% water and below 19%. And the whole point of the high end of that is we don't want it to ferment. So, but the scale on the USDA's website, because of course I looked at their PDF, it goes all the way down to 13%. It goes all the way up to 21.9%. So it's no single factor. But I would say if I had honey at 21.9%, I would be very concerned. I would definitely dry it down. I have never personally had honey go to 13%. So the next thing I have to say to Daryl is, how are you determining that your honey is too dry? So that leads me to another topic, refractometers. Refractometers are a way that we can find out what the moisture percentage is. And then you might think, if you think the way I do, if I were a Food and Drug Administration inspector, if I had to inspect honey, uh, what would I have to use to find out what the moisture percentage is. Will it be something like this? This is a MISCO refractometer, and these are made uh, for specialties for the industry. So an inspector would go through, this thing takes two AAA batteries, and you get thousands of readings from a single you know, set of batteries. There are three of these, because later on today, somebody else asked, what refractometer would you recommend? There are so many and they're on Amazon, for example. And uh, I used to use the standard refractometers and they're inexpensive, 40 bucks, 50 bucks would be kind of an expensive one and they go all the way down, but how do we know they're accurate? Unless you balance what you've tested on your refractometer against a calibrated traceable refractometer that would, for example, be used by a food inspector. Um, then you won't know how much it's off by, right? So if I'm recommending a refractometer, it's the MISCO, and they make three of them. That's why some people will look this up and go, Fred, that thing is $500. Well, no, you're looking then at uh, the MISCO 3. There's three versions of this, so I'm actually answering a question ahead of time. But if I wanted to know the moisture content for sure, I would get a calibrated refractometer to know. But uh, I personally don't want to see you bring the moisture content up in your honey. And I think you'll find out if you get a hold of a refractometer that you're not as dry as you think. Uh, so the next thing, of course, is put it in a hot room, heat it up, get it up to 110 degrees or lower and uh, make it more pourable because there's a perception of quality when honey is thicker, pours slower, spreads out slower, sets at the bottom of your cup of tea, however you take it, and you have to do a lot of mixing to get it to blend up. Uh, I don't see that. That's a problem a lot of people wish they had. And the other thing I'd like to mention, since we're talking about Texas, we're having heat waves in a lot of parts of the country right now. There's a tendency to want to vent your beehives a lot because they're stifling, right? We transfer human feelings and human coping mechanisms to honeybees. And that is wrong. And I'll explain why. Uh, because we have a tendency to um, open the vent on the top. So give them a lot of airflow through there, a lot of air through the bottom, let the whole thing just circulate. 
Let air flow in through the entrance down at the bottom of your hive. Let it go up and through and out the top. And keep that going because that's got to cool the bees, right? Well, they're definitely going to go into overdrive uh, to try to keep up with that. And it might be something that you're not considering, which is if they have brood in there, they're feeding the brood. The brood has to be kept humid. Which means when you vent through the top in these hot climates, I know it seems like the right thing to do, but when you vent through the top and the air is flowing through there and that super dry, you know, southwest air is going through there, it's drying out your brood also. So now they have to have massive amounts of water to spread across the, the brood area, including the caps of the pupae, and they have to fan and they're keeping it cool, but they're also keeping the humidity levels up. And they're fighting against a draft that the beekeeper created by opening the top, which they are not designed to cope with. Because in the environment they would be in, it would be an encapsulated situation where they would have a big entrance. Nothing wrong with opening up your entrance by itself. But when you vent through the top, you're potentially drying out your brood. So I want you to be very careful and think about that. If you had a way of measuring humidity inside your hive, you actually want a higher humidity level. If it drops too low, again, your brood's in jeopardy. And just like when you chill brood and expose it to elements and temperatures and parameters that they can't cope with, you end up seeing dead brood cast out later. And so they're cleaning them off. So hopefully we're not doing that. Uh, you could provide shade for your hives. So if you have a lean-to or something like that, or you could Put up an umbrella or string some cheesecloth or something like that that air passes through but the sunlight gets diffused thereby lowering the temperature a little bit much more effective than venting through the hive and causing them to compensate for that by increasing humidity in a very low humidity environment question number three this comes from buckskin what is it uh, benjamin okay I watch a lot of your videos and have uh, February 27 Layens Horizontal Hives and was hoping you could help me as I'm new to beekeeping. Uh, one of the hives is very full, extremely active, but I'm concerned that they're going to outgrow the hive and want to swarm. No swarm cells yet, but my question to you is, what is the latest time of year you would recommend a split? I'm in western New York, the Finger Lakes region. So right now where I am, uh, also because of forage that's available in the environment, there's a lot of it here. So the recovery rates are still really good. Here, would I do a split right now? I have the same problem. By the way, my lanes hive is wall to wall and my long Langstroth horizontal hive is also wall to wall bees and resources. So we have to do something with them. The Langstroth is very easy for me. The, um, you know, pull the frames and, and we can extract honey if we want to and replace those right away and keep them working because that's one way to create space. If you've got a lay-ins hive that's got 20 frames in it, for me it's a little more work, but you pull some of the honey frames and uh, you can replace those. So in order to relieve some of the congestion in there, the population of the bees is one thing, but space to work and continue working and not become idle and then think about producing a new queen and getting out of there, um, we can provide them space by extracting honey if they're full, if it's like you're not far from where I am. So when we have full capped frames of honey, the good news about my long Langstroth hive is it's five feet long. I made it longer than I thought I would ever need to, but guess what? I'm using every frame now. So that's 30 uh, deep frames in the long Langstroth. And uh, for my lay hives, I have 20 frames and they're all 90% full right now problem a lot of people are having. So one of the things I want to fall back on here is if you have to pull honey, you can do that, but you probably don't have replacement frames. So you need to extract and put it right back in there. Gives them something to do and room to expand. And the combs that you harvest from should be immediately following your brood frames. That's where they need to sense the extra space because that's where they feel congested. If they get a perception that it's nothing but honey beyond the brood, that's when they get stimulated to reproduce and kick out a new swarm. So that's one thing, nothing wrong with an early harvest. I'm gonna to have to do it here too. 
And uh, that's the best I can suggest. The other thing is, for some people that are trying to do a more natural Varroa control without a lot of chemicals, if you have Varroa and you know that you need to control them, since we have this problem this year with massive populations of bees and all the hives, all of them, they're all just maxing out. Uh, and nothing's been different really this year other than the way I wintered mine last year with insulated inner hive covers. And those were by Bee Smart Design. So we tried those last year. Definitely conserved a lot more resources going through winter. The hive walls were not insulated anymore. And the only feed that we had on now were uh, the Hive Alive fondant patties. Nothing else. And they didn't even use those all the way up. So I don't know what's going on. We just had a really good year so far. Now, what to do with this big population you can cage your queen, and I'm going to, I know I said I would do it last time, but uh, put up a procedure for that. And you can create an artificial brood break. And uh, because if you're so populated now, better to get everything under control, because look what's down the road. They're not prepping for winter yet, as far as the bees that are gonna be in the colony uh, are concerned. Uh, they're gonna start producing those about mid-September, to late September, early October is when they'll start producing the winter bees, the workers that will be with your colony through winter. Those need to be the healthiest workers you can possibly generate. And so one of the opportunities we have right now, since we're fat and happy with too many bees, is if we create this brood break, and uh, now once there's nothing but open cells in the entire hive, now we can treat with a single treatment of oxalic acid vaporization and wipe out mites almost completely and then thereby reduce profoundly the virus loads that your bees will be dealing with going into the fall. And the other thing I've noticed is uh, colonies that you do that on compared to colonies that you do not do that on. So if they do a swarm, they're going to be behind the ones that you did an artificial um, brood break on. Likewise, if you don't treat for varroa mites, their numbers and productivity will be lower at the end of the year than those that you did a brood break on, that you got rid of the varroa mites, and that they came out healthy, not dealing with varroa, and on they went. Now, if you only hand select specific colonies within your apiary to do this with, we know now that there is such a profound level of drift going on, bees to colonies trading around all over the place, uh, the potential for mite-loaded colonies to distribute their mites to other colonies is extremely high. So for backyard beekeepers with your small numbers of hives, I personally recommend that you would do this to all of your hives at the same time because that prevents uh, your varroa mites from reestablishing all over the place and puts all of your bees ahead. So just food for thought there. Plus, uh, when people have splits and things like that, you have nine days <clears throat> easily before uh, varroa mites get under cap cells. And then so you have an opportunity to treat those too. So I hope we're thinking about that. If you're treatment free, I'm not telling you that you have to treat now. But I am suggesting that you have opportunities to really mitigate mite damage on your apiary. So that's my advice. Relieve some stress. Uh, Go ahead and extract some honey, get the frames right back out there and uh, consider maybe, ob obviously anybody that's feeding their bees and has population issues, I don't recommend feeding at all. In fact, the swarms that I collected this year, uh, and we did several, uh, we did not feed them. The only bees that were fed, and that was a mistake, were my observation hives because I wanted them to get started off good and there were, you know, very small numbers of bees going in there. They were all swarms except for the ones that I took out of my nucleus resource hives. And I took very few, only three frames for one and two frames for the other. So I'd give them, I did give them sugar syrup uh, so that they could draw out their comb. But I stopped that more than a week ago because they're also progressing too fast. And I want to hold them back much better for the bees if they can get by without being fed at all let them get what they need from the environment and then that kind of holds them back in pace with what the environment is providing so next year <clears throat> i don't think anything's going to get fed around here 
exception being emergency feed for winter will still be the hive alive fondant packs right on top instead of what I've used, uh, which were the rapid rounds with dry sugar in them for winter emergency feed. My emergency feed going forward will be Hive Alive fondant packs. And I can put a link down below. That stuff works. I'm very happy with it. So next question, number four, comes from Brad from Chester, New Hampshire. Hi, Fred, you've mentioned in the past about some honeybees known for biting off the legs on Varroa mites. I have heard a first year Sask I have a first year Saskatras colony that is going to going great and I plan to harvest the flow frames within the next few days. I checked the bottom tray today and found quite a few dead Varroa mites. I looked at them under my microscope and all were missing most of their legs. Only some short stubbles were left. Have you heard of anything about Saskatraz bees being leg biters, or do the Varroa legs fall off after they die? I've noticed a lot of grooming happening on the landing board. So first of all, there are a lot of um, genetics and lines of bees that are being raised. Purdue, uh, ankle biters they're called, there's mite maulers. And I've done similar uh, checks to see when I find dead mites on the bottom board. I look to see what condition they're in. Do they have all their parts? And oftentimes they do. So they have their toes, their feet, they have everything. And uh, even my bee weaver bees, they were the first ones that I noticed were biting the feet off. And I don't even know why they do that other than when they chew off the feet with their mandibles uh, and the, the tips of their feet are the easiest part to nip off. Biting off the whole leg would be a challenge for the honeybee. So there might be something else. You have to keep our minds open when we look at that stuff. There could be something else in the tray under your screen that could be feeding on them. So that's just, just to stay open to all possibilities as to what might be happening. But when it comes specifically specifically to the Olivares uh, uh, breeders, which are the only ones that are selling uh, the Saskatrass line legally here in the United States, they're the ones with the agreement, um, this is a quote from them. We have found Varroa tolerance is not a stable trait with their bees. So they don't know of any uh, mite mauling traits that the Saskatraz bees have right now as it stands. That could change in the future because like all the other stock, they're constantly improving. But uh, that's not one of the traits that they're known for. But that doesn't mean that if you've got one, they're not doing it because part of their mating system is they open mate those queens and even though they put out mating yards to try to make sure that their genetics are under some control, they are open mated. So there is a chance you could be mixing with some genetics that have that trait where when they're grooming one another off and this active grooming is really, really good. Sometimes they overdo it and they pull pupa and everything else out when they don't really need to. But they're constantly policing the entire colony and uh, very feverishly going over forager bees when they come in. Sometimes they park them off to the side and a couple of bees go all over every detail of them. And if they get a mite off, um, the weavers will bite the feet on their way while they're pulling them off so that they can't climb back up on anything. So it's pretty darn effective. If you eliminate the feet, the mite can't climb. So it's a very good trait. But uh, a lot of grooming. Grooming traits are good. Hygienic traits are good. That means they're paying attention to brood and making sure that those areas are clean and maintained. Sometimes... In the same colony where there are mites, you'll see them uncapped. So there's open pupa there, but they'll uncap that because the mites then dry out and can't reproduce. So they can smell mites in the cells. It's pretty interesting stuff. But Saskatraz specifically, according to those who are breeding them, say that that's not a trait right now. But it is cool to look at the condition of the mites, see what's going on down there, but look for other critters. Sometimes there are larval stage uh, of insects that are down in there in your trays doing some pretty grisly things to the stuff that falls down there. So next question comes from Dan. This is question number five. I live in Bellingham, Washington State and uh, had bought a new nuclear colony of bees in May. There was a queen and was laying extremely well. All four out of five frames in that nuke were side to side full of brood. 
Somewhere around June, I had added a second brood box, and once they filled seven frames out with drawn comb, I had placed a honey super. After the next few weeks, I did the inspection and found no problems. There were three frames of capped brood, two frames of new larvae, and one full of eggs. The next day, I found few bees died somewhere around 20 on the landing board, and their proboscis was sticking out. And at the side of the entrance, I had found my queen bee had also died without her proboscis sticking out, and she was marked, so I know it was from this hive. I'd done some research and found that the bees had poisoning of some sort. But the questions are, could the queen bee get poisoned, or was she just rejected by the bees? And that's a very good question, because let's think about it. I've had this happen before, an acute dose, a lethal dose, of some kind of toxin in the environment, killing off a bunch of the foragers and then finding them dead, as described here, with their tongues out. Sometimes you could see them in front of the hive trembling, uh, demonstrating some nerve disruption. So they don't seem to be able to find their way around. They seem to go in circles sometimes. So these are things to look at. Uh, and of course, with the tongue extended. And uh, one of the things we can do is, of course, collect them and send them off for evaluation. But you need 100 specimens. So this doesn't even sound like it qualifies. you got 20 dead. Uh, another way to find out what the real numbers are is to get out there right around sunrise or a little before sunrise because all night long the undertaker bees have been pushing them out. And you'll find that sometimes when there's a, a poisoned bee, they're dragging themselves out really slow. They're trying to leave the hive. That's how they protect it. And that's what I'm getting to when it comes to the queen who has access to the queen. So this is why I think she was not part of the poisoning. And that's because field bees come in and they bring nectar with them. If they bring pollen, the pollen they can put into their pollen stores themselves. If the pollen itself is toxic, in other words, if there's some kind of pesticide uh, that's systemic to the plant where they got the pollen, uh, that gets feed, fed to the developing larvae in their open state. So after the egg hatches, the larvae's in there, and it gets fed from the nurse bees, and they, of course, create that nourishment from the pollen that's stored there. Now, so I would expect to see, if it's the pollen, I would expect to see affected brood, and that the nurse bees themselves would also be dying because they would have ingested it and they're creating royal jelly and the food resources for the larvae. So the bees that are out with their tongues out, do they appear to be young in hive bees? And are their wings in perfect condition? And they have that look of freshness that bees have when they've never been out foraging? Or do they look like foragers that have frayed edges on their wings? Do they look like the the hair on their bodies is somewhat worn off. They spend a lot of time going in and out of cells and things like that. So their thorax might be somewhat bald. Uh, so they show signs of wear and tear. So this, this is part of the evaluating where it's going and what's being impacted. And first of all, 20 bees is not a big number. So I don't know if that would really even get my attention very much. But this will help us look to see if it becomes part of what's happening to the nurse bees. Then also those nurse bees provide the retinue that maintains and feeds the queen. So there again, the queen could be being fed from toxic pollen stores in theory, but it's a very small percentage. So 20 bees coming out. Then I would likewise expect to see some dead larvae along with that. So not just a few bees in the queen. So it almost sounds like they got rid of the queen. You know, if I'm guessing. But, uh, and I hope that you'll give us an update because if they intentionally got rid of the queen, they would make super seizure cells. And then you'd see evidence of that fairly soon. 20 or fewer bees on the landing board is not a terrible one. I've had hundreds die on the landing board in front of the hive and everything else. And then that hive recovered on its own later. So just food for thought. But if you want to know if you ever get a die off like that, if you're listening and you want to, Send them off because you just have to know what happened to those bees. You need over 100 bees, so a minimum. Go to the Beltsville Lab, uh, which is the, like the leading testing facility here in the United States. And uh, they have parameters exactly on what you have to do. You have to put them in isopropanol and uh, prepare them and preserve the bees so that they can be sent off for evaluation. 
but I think that's a very small event. And just based on the description, I don't think that's what killed the queen because there would be other collateral uh, die-offs too inside the hive. If it was strong enough to kill the queen, it would have killed off a lot of others as well. Those nurse bees would be out there. In my opinion, that's what I'm thinking. Question number six comes from Peter, Manchester, Tennessee. I have a hive that was hot. I ordered in a queen from someone, and I have always gotten great queens from. But uh, for those of you who don't know what it is when a hive is hot, now that we're talking about hot temperatures everywhere, you might be thinking, oh, the hot was overheated. The hive was overheated. No, hot means their defensive response is elevated. And when you go out there, maybe you're just visiting the bee yard, you're out there with your coffee cup, and you want to see what's going on, and a bee zips up and stings you on the temple without giving the courtesy of the high-frequency buzz, without giving you a couple of head butts, uh, they come straight at you and start stinging. More than one. Several, maybe. And then you have to you have to retreat. You have to go get your bee stuff just to stare at your bees. Hot hive. Okay, so. I've always gotten great queens from these people. And it killed the old queen, installed a new one, and she was accepted and released 16 days ago. So, put in a new queen, accepted by the resident bees, and released her from her cage 16 days ago. I inspected the hive today and there was hardly any brood. Seven or eight capped cells and about the same of larvae. Very spotty on two or three frames. Didn't see any eggs, but I did see the queen. So this is going to be my question again, as we talked about this earlier. And it's good that we kind of have similar situations over and over. Because when you're learning, this will start to ring a bell and you'll know what to look for in the colony that you're having problems with. So what is the population of this colony? Since Peter doesn't give me those details, you know, do they have 10,000 bees in that hive? Do they have enough to take care of the new eggs that are being produced by this queen? So, And maybe they do. And if they do, then we still have a problem. But if they don't, that becomes the problem. It's a population situation. They need enough bees to tend to the brood, to clean the colony, to feed the queen, to make wax to store resources, to guard the landing board, and to forage for resources. So, see, it's a division of labor that all requires these things to occur at the same time, so we need several thousand bees to do it. So the fact that, again, this queen is laying, uh, saw the queen, didn't see the eggs, this queen uh, could be poorly mated, so we might need more time to see how that happens. Or uh, she actually might be deficient. So this was ordered in. I don't know what the queen went through when she came. I don't know if she went through the mail. We've had a lot of heat. You could partially sterilize a queen in transit. So there are a lot of things to think about. But the good news is if uh, they're a little stressed and this queen isn't very good, but she's actually producing eggs, uh, you still have the opportunity now to create a new queen from those eggs. But now we're pushed back 30 days before we see new bees right so but you could so that's it uh, did an alcohol wash also and found two mites and 300 bees any idea on what this could be or how to fix it so that's it population first so if they need a population boost and you've got the resources frame of nurse bees and brood from another colony stick them in there and give them a real kick off and see if that doesn't change things Otherwise, they'll make a replacement queen and supersede her if that's the problem. Now, this time of year, as we get later on, an earlier question said, you know, how late can it be before we, we can no longer make splits? So if you're not going to, if you make a split, the, what really you've run out of time on is replacing the queen. So that's when you buy in a laying queen from somebody, hopefully in your area first. If you've got somebody that's got really good reputation, good bees, good queens, good record of performance, then you bring in a laying queen right away. And so within three days, you've got her out of her cage and now she's laying eggs and you're back in business ready for the fall. If you wait for them to make a new one, we're 30 days out easily uh, before you're going to see new bees in the colony, which puts us into, you know, the first week of August, second week of August. So they could still make it, but you would be way ahead if you installed a laying queen already. And that's what me personally, what my resource hives are for. I'd rather see them fall back, take their queen, put her in the new colony. In fact, bring her right along with a brood 
uh, cap brood and open larvae and things like that and stick her right in there, right on her frame, right in that colony that needs reinforcement and then let my resource hive build and replace because that helps me keep those resource hives under control because they populate too fast in those small spaces. So keep us posted, Peter. I hope we find out what was going on there. Maybe she was just getting a slow start, but if you ended up replacing her, let us know what you did, how it worked. Question number seven comes from Gary, Sacramento, California. As a new beekeeper, the thought of collecting bees for a sugar shake or alcohol might count is daunting, particularly the risk of accidentally killing the queen. Any tips on how I can mitigate this risk? Well, there's several tips. By the way, I've done the, I don't do alcohol washes anymore because the um, Dawn Ultra Pure Essentials does a better job of releasing mites from your bees and it's cheaper than alcohol. Uh, but you risk killing the bees, of course. You kill all the bees that go into either an alcohol wash or if you use Dawn Dish Detergent. By the way, thanks to Randy Oliver for that research. And uh, the thing is, uh, if you're new and you're concerned and you don't want to kill your queens because even experienced beekeepers have uh, made the mistake of going to the brood. And of course, the brood that has the most mites on the workers would be open brood because that's where the nurse bees are there feeding them. And nurse bees tend to have mites on their abdomens if they're present. And so when you do that, who else is on that frame a large percentage of the time, the queen, because she's there laying in the cells right where the new brood is, right where the eggs are. And so those are the best places to collect bees that would have mites on them. So you get a really concentrated count of the mites, but you also risk collecting the queen. Now, if you dumped her into a sugar shake, the worst thing that happens to your queen is she got dusted with powdered sugar and she got shaken around for a while. And of course she had the dwell time. She had to sit there and be stressed. But the bees that are in there with her are trying to clean the queen up. So she's being helped a little bit. The good news is when you open it up so that you can shake out the mites and everything and do your little mite wash, uh, if you see the queen then, she's not dead and you can put her back in. If you did a, you know, a dish soap or isopropanol alcohol wash, then she's dead for sure. And that's happened to some very high-profile high beekeepers have opened that up and seen their queen dead right in there. And I'm sorry to laugh about it. It's serious business. It hasn't happened to me though. So the other part of that is uh, when you're looking your frames over before you collect the nurse bees to do your wash. And the other part of that is too, when you shake the bees into a plastic tub off the frames, um, give them a minute because the foragers are gonna fly off and go back to the hive anyway. They're gonna be annoyed and they're gonna zip right back there or they'll fly out. Uh, but the nurse bees will stay in the tub just waiting around. They don't know where they are. They don't know where they live. You took them from a dark place, put them in a light place that they don't understand. And then you're going to scoop up your half a cup of bees and you're going to do your test. So give them a minute for that. That gives you an extra opportunity also to look for that queen. She's too heavy to fly just like nurse bees. So she can kind of do a little fly hop and land, fly hop and land, which is why sometimes people see her in the grass trim the grass and everything around your hive. If you have tall grass, get it out of there. So you'll be able to see if your queen ends up on the ground. Uh, the other thing is try to spot the queen and put her on a frame and get her in a safe spot before you collect your bees. So learn to very carefully search for your queen. If you need to bring in a friend, it's very beneficial for new beekeepers, especially to get your queen's thorax marked. This year it's yellow. Uh, somebody can help you get that mark on there and then that will also be another level of insurance to make sure that you can look for her, find her, and not put her in your mite count. So that's how you mitigate the risk. Know where she is. Do a method, sugar shake, that doesn't kill your bees. And then she'll still be alive, shaken, not dead. So question number eight comes from Craig from Virginia. Can you use a green drone frame above the queen excluder for the bees to fill with honey. Southwest Virginia. Drone frames, we show this a lot. They're green. The cells that are embossed on this are larger. They're drone size. Drones are males. 
in general, that frame is used so that your beads will match the embossing there, create the larger cells that are exclusively for drones or honey and resource storage, and they'll draw them out. And then people pull those drone frames to control varroa mites by attracting them to those cells. And when they're capped over, they pull it out, freeze it, whatever they do, and then put it back in, let the bees clean it up, or they feed it to their chickens or something else like that. But uh, the question here is, can we put that above the queen excluder for the bees to fill with honey? If those cells are already drawn out, there's no reason you can't let them use it for honey. Um, but the thing that occurs to me here is that cell is a deep cell, deep frame, goes into your deep brood box. So if you're putting it up above your queen excluder, which is usually a honey super, now you're talking about a deep brood box. So you're potentially over 70 pounds of honey when you go to pull that off. So it's workable, you know, on a practical level, it would work, but that's a heavy box. Most people, when they get up to honey supers above the queen excluder, uh, then those would be mediums. So very interesting there, but yeah, they use them for resources when they, they can't lay eggs, when the queen can't put her eggs up there, uh, they'll use it just for nectar storage. Happens all the time. And so this is question number nine, which I kind of already covered in an earlier question. This comes from Ron, Frisco, Texas. I'm a new beekeeper in my second year of beekeeping and I've collected some honey, but curious about the water content of the honey because some of the frames I've harvested were not fully capped. What honey refractometer do you recommend? I've browsed Amazon and there's some cheap ones, less than 30 bucks with good reviews, but I'm skeptical of the reviews because the reviewer is a new keeper just like me do they really know the refractometer actually works so that's what i was suggesting earlier uh, find somebody that has a calibrated refractometer use your refractometer that you get from ebay or amazon or wherever you happen to get it if you want an inexpensive one and then uh, match them up check the calibration and of course, the key calibration to check would be the upper limit. So I would set it at 18.5%. Uh, or if you had honey that was at 18% or something like that, the upper level would be good to test and uh, see where your refractometer is. And refractometers are adjustable, so you can make it uh, match up with whatever the calibrated unit is that you have. And I wrote the prices down here for these MISCOs for those of you who are sitting on heavy wallets and you want to thin them down so that your back is not stressed when you sit in your chair too long. The MISCO Beekeeper 1, so this is a model PA201X-325. So Beekeeper 1, BKPR1 is what it says on it, that's $375. That's for moisture only. The Beekeeper 2, BKPR2, goes for $470, moisture and solids in the honey. And then for those of you who have to have the Cadillac of everything, $565 for the MISCO Beekeeper 3, which does moisture, solids, and specific gravity readings. So these are specifically made for honey inspectors. And if you want one on that level, by the way, I was going to post a link to one of these units on Amazon, but Amazon is more expensive than if you go to the actual MISCO website and just buy it direct from them. So MISCO.com is where you find all these refractometers. Amazon is um, $10 more per unit. So there's that. So I already answered that question. If you have the money, these are not going to wear out. It's calibrated. It's ready to go. It's digital. You don't have to read a, a meter. You don't have to look through it. You don't have to worry if you uh, set the cal just right. Every one of those refractometers comes with specific calibration uh, procedures. So follow whatever it comes with. Sometimes it requires you to use extra virgin olive oil and things like that. I used to use them, but I'm very happy with MISCO. Question number 10. Last question for today comes from Greg in Boone, Iowa. So it says, I have a question on swarms. I have two packages. I purchased this April. One hive swarmed four days ago, which I actually witnessed. The first one I've ever seen. My fourth year having three or four hives. They were about 12 feet up in a walnut tree. I decided to collect the swarm. 
I used my Polaris Ranger and a six foot step ladder to reach the branch and shook them into a cardboard box. For those of you who don't know, Polaris Ranger is not some guy that's dressed like a ranger that lifts you up. It's a, it's a ATV. It's like a all wheel drive thing. That's probably got a platform on the back that put his ladder on. So it's a vehicle. <clears throat> so I poured them into the box with drawn comb, left them in the back of my Ranger until the next morning. And then I moved them on a stand close to where they swarm from. The next day, I put a frame of honey and one-to-one -one sugar on top. The next day, I did not see many bees coming in or out. Open it up today, and they are all gone. What did I do wrong? All that effort, now they're gone. Here's what you did um, that I would not have done. And that is you left them on spot, and you added resources, and uh, left everything set up in the trap just the way it was. When I find bees in a swarm trap, the minute they're moved in and the queen is in there, I take them and I go. I don't wait. I don't let them set up shop. I don't let the foragers start to get familiar with that area and orient to that location as their final destination. Even though that's what they elected to do, that's where they wanted to be. Uh, I catch them, take them back. And if the foragers that are out and about that weren't there when you pulled it, when they return, they'll go back to their original hive. So they won't just be lost in the woods. So that is what I see as the problem. You left them there, you set them up right there, and uh, you should have taken them back to your apiary and gone ahead and situated them exactly where they ultimately are going to be. Sugar syrup's fine. Uh, sometimes you don't always have to put like, uh, it says here you put a box of drawn comb. So I don't know if there were resources in that drawn comb or if it's just honeycomb itself. That's a good move, empty comb in the frame, let them build it up themselves. That sounds great, but uh, that's what I see as what might have gone wrong. So that's it. Now we're in the fluff section. That was the last question of the day. Yeah, when you collect swarms, get that box out of there, put a new swarm trap up right away because you can catch another one. We're kind of late in the year to be collecting swarms, but why let them fly? What are their chances without you? Very slim. So go ahead, hive them up, take a chance, see what happens. Uh, so today's... Uh, information we have upcoming i have upcoming interviews coming up this week that are going to be interesting hopefully to some of you we've got some new information we've got some scientists doing research and stuff that's going to be very interesting and uh, we're going to show you some updates on the observation hives and the way to be building we had the one uh, the middle observation hive they built uh, because it was frames that were put in that had eggs and resources no queen and uh, we were just going to let them build their own. So it's a nine frame box, all deeps. And we put two frames of resources in there and they built uh, queen cells right off the bat on the outer frame so that we could look at them. And the very next day before they even capped them, those queen cells were chewed apart and gone. That tells me they built other queen cells in between the frames where I couldn't see them. And so we're going to be doing updates on all of the observation hives in the way to be building coming up this week so you can see all the progress and it's really impressive uh the next thing that i want to talk about is today's shout out now normally i like to find somebody that's done something related to a topic that we're covering but uh, this time i have something new this is food for thought this is going to be controversial among beekeepers i like to pop in on a youtube channel that's called the national honey show so I'd like you to look that up too, the National Honey Show. And they're on YouTube, that's their channel. But July 1st, they put out a video that I thought was really interesting. Now, I'm also a photographer, so sometimes I'll put up a video like that and I'll let it play in the background while I'm editing my work. And uh, so this talk on July 1st was by Tobin Torben Schiffer. And uh, he did a presentation, and this is the title of it, How Modern Beekeeping Enhances Nectar Competition and Contributes to Species Extinction. In other words, commercial beekeeping and the saturation of honeybees in specific areas not only push out native pollinators and specifically other bee species, but actually are causing their extinction. And that's just a tiny part of it. So I would like you to follow the link uh, down in the video description. Go look at this video, and I'm really interested. I put a comment on there this morning 
I'm very interested in hearing what pe people think because I also kind of looked at the National Honey Show. What do they stand for? Like they've had Dr. Tom Seeley, they've had Jamie Ellis, they've had Michael Palmer. They bring in all these big researchers and people that are area experts in beekeeping. And uh, obviously most of them are in support of commercial beekeeping, trying to do it better, healthier bees, things like that. But what uh, Torben Schiffer says in this video is, for example, you should never sell honey. You should not be taking the bees honey. So it's, it's a very interesting position for the National Honey Show to have to put on a, a speaker who basically says, we are doing it all wrong <laughs> completely. So, because I had so many aha moments when he was talking, I said, did he really just say that? And he also says that putting beehives on um, rooftops is animal abuse. So I wanna know what other people's comments are uh, regarding that talk. It's over an hour long, give it a listen. Try to keep an open mind because often what happens is uh, someone that we're listening to will say one thing, one detail, and uh, we know that's wrong, right? Or at least we think it's wrong. So then that does it. We reject everything else that person has to say. But I encourage you to try to stick through the whole thing. And uh, because I found myself divided, I was like, oh, yeah, that sounds good. Hmm. But then when they say things like uh, honeybees outpollinate other bees, well, they do that by sheer number. Um, but it's been my observation here on my property in the state of Pennsylvania in the United States, which may be different, um, that the, the native pollinators out compete my honeybees because they get to more flowers in a shorter amount of time. Uh, there are bee species here that the honeybee can't be pushing out because they actually can exploit more. He says that honeybees don't specialize and therefore they access everything and therefore they compete with all pollinators. Well, for example, bumblebees here um, access flowers and, and the design of the flower prevents the entrance of the honeybee to get nectar and resources while the bumblebee can do that. Plus honeybees, when they fly, they fly to specific floral sources on that flight. They don't shift around where the advantage there goes to again, like bumblebees, which do visit multiple flower species wherever the nectar and resources are located that they're trying to get. So there's some things. So I'm wondering what you guys will think. I hope you look at that. Keep an open mind. See what you get out of it. And is the world really on the wrong track when it comes to beekeeping? And in fact, should bees be kept at all? So there's some strong controversy associated with some of the topics that are brought up there. Can't wait to hear what other people have to say. And uh, I wish I knew more about the National Honey Show. But thanks for being with me here today and for giving me all of your valuable time to think about bees in your backyard and how you might manage them. So I hope you're going to have a fantastic weekend. And thanks for watching. Leave your comments down below. Don't forget to click the thumbs up to remind yourself that you've seen this episode. Thanks for being here. Have a great weekend.